I'm very excited that our next presentation uh, is entitled A Game of Drones, Advancing Discovery and Innovation in Coastal Research. And our presenter is Dr. Corey Garza of California State University, Monterey Bay. Um, Dr. Garza is a professor in the Department of Marine Science at CSUMB. Prior to being at CSUMB, he was at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, where he served as a scientific liaison to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Long Island Sound Study. His research interests are in the area of marine landscape ecology. He uses marine technologies and computer modeling uh, to study the relationship between habitat complexity and patterns of species distribution and abundance in marine communities. At CSUMB, he oversees a number of National Science Foundation and NOAA-funded programs that include Monterey Bay uh, Regional Ocean Sciences Research, Experiences for Undergraduates, the NOAA Center for Coastal and Marine Ecosystems, and the NSF ASPIRE, which is an acronym for Active Societal Participation in Research and Education. He's a fellow of the California Academy of Sciences in addition to being at CSUMB, and he serves on the board of directors of the American Geological Union. Will you please welcome Corey Garza. Great. Well, thank you, everyone, uh, for having me here today. So I'm, I'm looking forward to talking to you all about drones. I, I like drones uh, a lot. Um, so what I'm going to do is taking about a 30-minute tour of sort of how we're starting to use drones at CSUMB to facilitate sort of new types of research in the ocean sciences as well as education uh, in the ocean sciences. So when we kind of think about traditional sort of coastal science methods, you might have like a vision of Jacques Cousteau in your head and like David Attenborough talking about the great blue expanse and all of that. And we've kind of utilized pretty much the same tools for the better part of the last 40 years or so. And these are things like quadrats, you're seeing a little plastic thing there. It's a very common tool, you put it down, you count what's in there, that's how you estimate you know, what, what's around. Uh, transect tape, you're seeing a couple of my uh, former students there up in British Columbia, you put down a little meter tape and you count what's on there like every centimeter or so. Or scuba diving is like the real you know, one that everyone's really familiar with. Those are some of my other students down at one of our research sites on Catalina Island. Now, these tools have sort of been what we've had pretty much for the last 40 years. They've helped advance what we know about the ocean, but one of the things we're starting to recognize, it's they have, they're starting to, their limitations are starting to show. It's like when you have a, an older computer and it's starting to show its age at some point. And one of the ways we're starting to show the age is a lot of the questions that we're interested in looking at in the ocean, they're becoming a lot more complex. If you look at issues around climate change, for example, they just don't impact the area under the quadrat. They impact the whole West Coast, right? And it's really hard to assess what's going on if you're limited right, by your tools. So about 10 years or so ago, um, the National Academy of Sciences sort of organized a workshop uh, working with the National Science Foundation, NOAA, I believe it was the Office of Naval Research. And one of the things that they were discussing is they really wanted to talk about is what is an ocean scientist going to look like in the 21st century? Like what type of tool sets, right, do they need to have? And what got, it got summarized in this paper by, in Science back in 2013 by Kintage. <clears throat> and a big part of what came out of that is, as sort of ocean scientists, we had to be more open to adopting emerging technologies at the time, whether it was satellite technology, you know, new technologies around DNA and genetics work. And the big one that came out of that is what we refer to as autonomous technologies. These are technologies around robotics, things that can work on their own. Because if we really wanted to get a better handle on what was sort of going on in the ocean, we really needed to adapt what we were doing in terms of the types of tools and approaches we're using. And so, you know, really whether we wanted to or not, um, automation is coming right, at this part. Um, you know, the way that we've done stuff for 50 years is probably not going to continue to be the only way that we do science. And, you know, emerging young scientists who want to interest in the ocean need to be willing and able to embrace sort of these emerging technologies. And so here at CSUMB, uh, you know, what we have is we've set up a drone. We're one of, the, I think, the only West Coast academic institution with a coastal drone research uh, program at this part. And so we use it to facilitate both research and education activities at the campus. Uh, we're funded in large part by NOAA and the National Science Foundation, NSF. And a large part, what it's starting to give us, the drones are allowing us to do on the research end of things, we can actually cover a lot more ground in a much shorter amount of time uh, than what we used to be able to do. The other thing that, you know, the agency they're liking, it's that we actually have reduced the number of people you actually need to go and get that information. So I've been doing marine science since the early 90s when I was a young kid. 
Uh, and uh, we used to go like maybe survey a tide pool. It'd be like five or six of us having to do that using traditional methods. It would take us about five hours uh, to do something like that. You're seeing one of my former grad students, Taylor there. She's working the same site I first went to when I was about 19 years old and it took five or six of us to do it. She surveyed all of it in like 20 minutes with the drones on her own at this part. So it's showing you how rapidly it's advanced, how, th how this tech has advanced. So I want to give you a little bit of a rundown of what we have there, what are kind of the toys, <laughs> so to speak, that we have. And so we kind of array our drones across a lot of different types of platforms here, and they're outfitted to conduct different types of mapping missions in the ocean environment, from the open ocean to tide pools to wetlands and kelp forests. Now, the workhorses of our fleet here are these two characters here, uh, the Mavic, which is on the left, and this Phantom. And the Phantom is probably the one that's probably most familiar uh, to folks in the U.S., one of the first one that was sort of commercially available uh, here in the U.S. Um, they're both what you call quad rider drones. They have four propellers, so they can hover like helicopters there. They have high, high-resolution cameras. When I first got into digital photography in the late 90s in graduate school, our lab had a five-megapixel camera, and that was like super advanced and high-tech. Um, that, like your phone, has like way more pixels uh, than that at this point. And so nowadays, these drones come with really high-resolution cameras. So you can pick up little tiny objects. Uh, that are out there. Uh, we use them for sort of these particular drones, we use for low altitude mapping. So if we're doing like tide pool surveys, uh, the Mavic there, I'll show you an example of that. That's what we use it for. The Phantoms and such, we use them for things like kelp forest uh, surveys these days. This is our other one. Its name is Drogon, like the big dragon <laughs> from uh, Game of Thrones uh, over there. And so this is one of our heavy payload uh, drones. It's what's known as a DJI Matrice 210. Uh, what we're able to do with this particular drone is we can put multiple types of instruments on at the same time. And so you're kind of seeing a front view uh, over there where one camera is your traditional, what you call a red, green, blue camera. So it's a type of camera you take to take your normal photos, maybe off your iPhone or something like that. The other camera there, that red box, was called a multi-spectral camera. So it can pick up different wavelengths of light that we can't see, infrared, ultraviolet. And so we can use that to pick up different species of plants or kelp right out in the ocean, different types of plankton species uh, because of that. And so it gives us the capability to actually do near shore oceanographic uh, work from the air. It's one of our newest additions, that's the Firefly 6. So this is our vertical takeoff and landing drone. So it looks like an airplane, but it takes off like a helicopter. Uh, if you're familiar with the Navy Ospreys, uh, they use them for troop transport. Like it takes off like a helicopter and the props rotate forward so it flies like a plane. This is built off the same engineering principle here. So you're seeing it being used over at Elkhorn Slough on it in a 42 megapixel camera. So we can see little paw prints uh, in the mud and that type of stuff uh, over there. But this is another type of drone that we have. We can also launch it from boats. It can actually reacquire, even if the boat moves, it can reacquire where the boat's at and come back. So we use it for sort of offshore work as well. And so as you can see with our basic infrastructure, we can do a whole lot of different types of things. And just so you know, we're not sort of sci-fi and fantasy sort of genre specific. Uh, we're also big Star Wars fans. So these are our latest group of drones known as the Rogue Squadron uh, over here. And so these are what is known as real-time kinematic drones. You notice they have these little look at, we call them the top hats on there. This is a special type of GPS unit that actually syncs up the drone with a, a series of satellites. And so we can actually get positioning on the ground down to the scale of about a centimeter. So we can pinpoint things like individual barnacles, mussels, you know, if you've got an abalone in there, we can pinpoint their position down to the level of a centimeter. So that one there on the left is kind of the modern version of the Phantom where it's got the traditional camera on it. The other one has a multi-spectral camera uh, built into it. So we're using that for sort of low level sort of algae monitoring and rocky intertidal systems, estuary monitoring and that type of thing. And so this is our next generation of drones right, that we're starting to build out at CSUMB. And so I'm going to walk you through some of the types of work that we do with these drones. And so one of the first things that we use these drones for is for intertidal or tide pool uh, monitoring. It's for, you know, scientists, it's our equivalent to the white lab rat. Um, it's also a place that has a lot of heavy monitoring because it's easy to get to. And you can usually sort of ascribe shifts in the community, not so much because the things moved away, because there's probably some impact on it, whether it's an anthropogenic or human-driven impact, or maybe you know, a bunch of predators uh, came in and ate it. So we actually use a lot of software. We use flight software. Uh, there's a couple of flight apps that we use called Drone Deploy and Pix4D. Um, you actually just put them on a smart device over there. And what you do is you create little mission uh, profiles. I don't know if you can see it right there. I can see the things here, but I'll walk over. You can actually create little mission profiles and tell the drone, here's where I want you to go, here's the altitude I want you to fly at, I want you to take pictures every, you know, every half meter, every 20 centimeters, whatever it is there, and that gets uploaded to the drone, and the drone goes off and does its thing, and we just kind of hang out there 
right, and, and let it go and do its work, and it'll have a Coke or something, you know, sitting on, on the beach there while the drone goes, go get, collects all our information, then comes back to us. So we actually don't pilot them unless we need to. We just I offload a mission profile, and the drone uses its internal AI and goes and does the mission for us, and then comes back to us. And so you can see one of the things we specialize in, this is Hopkins Marine Station, is doing really, really low altitude autonomous flight. So this is one of the challenges with doing work here. When most people work with drones, they want to fly really high in the air because they're mapping a forest, right, or mangroves or something along that line. We need to, if you're doing with tide pools, we're interested in little tiny animals, right, in this case. And so flying that high is not good for us in this case. So we need to fly really low. One of the challenges, though, for us is that most uh, flight apps, they only let you fly down to a level of 10 meters. Reason being is you don't want drones flying to people's heads. And so we went to the companies, they're like, why would you ever want to do that? Well, because we kind of map these little tiny things. So we found a company called Leachy that actually does that. So we can actually custom build our flight plans. And now we can actually have the drone flying about this high off the ground. And that's what you're actually seeing there it was one of our first days testing that out right in the field and we got it to work and <laughs> so we were kept our fingers crossed and now what we have I think we have the only sort of research and education team that can actually do these types of ultra low altitude drone flights maps at a high resolution these types of tide pool uh, environments and what we do with all that information like what do you do with it well we use the photos and so one of the things that we use, we use a process, it's called structure for motion photogrammetry. I don't want to get too detailed with it, but what it is, it's a way of taking your photos and the way that the, the drone is moving around, it can capture variation in the landscape that's underneath that. And I don't know, how many of you play video games? That's okay, I do, I still do, I'm almost 15, I still play video games, right? So if you ever play like, you know, you run across the virtual landscapes, it's a very similar sort of processing of that, where you're scanning in the environment and then you're using computer software to recreate a 3D environment. That's what we're actually doing here, except these are the photos put together to recreate a 3D visualization right, of the environment. And so this is an uh, intertidal area out at uh, Catalina Island near the USC Wrigley Institute uh, for Environmental Studies over there. And you can actually see me at the top there, a little tiny figure. That's the drone going over myself and a couple of our students as we're running a drone here. This is another place where it used to take us three or four hours to survey it, and the drone does it in like eight or nine minutes now right, at this point. And the other really cool thing is it's not static, so you can rotate it around. And so because it's, it's mapped in three axes, you don't just have the static picture. You can actually move all around it, zoom in and out. And what the investigator does or a student does is rather than having you just sit out there and count everything, you bring that back to the lab. And you know, I'm there in the morning, you know, my headphones and my cup of tea, and then I'm counting the stuff that's on there. But these days, we also use machine learning and artificial intelligence and train the software to actually identify everything that's on there. So now what used to take us a week to do, we can actually get data in the morning, get it all processed and put together like this in the, during, over the lunch hour, and then by the afternoon, we can actually have a computer auto-classified. And so in the span of a day now, we can get an assessment on what the environment looks like in the places that we're working at. And we're doing a lot of work here locally as well. You know, we're working locally with our colleagues over at uh, Hopkins Marine Station. And so one of the areas that they, one area they've been working at for quite a while now is this Hewitt line. If you don't know the story uh, behind it, Hewitt was a graduate student. He was a PhD student at, at Stanford in the early 1900s. And don't quote me on the year, it was somewhere around the 1920s, early 1930s. And his, his PhD thesis was he went and counted everything on this transect line. <clears throat> and then in the early 90s, uh, Jim Barry, who's over at Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, with, uh, Chuck Baxter, they said, hey, you know, we're dealing with the early issues of climate change. Maybe we go find that line and measure it. Let's see if species have changed over time. Maybe there's more southern species because the water's getting warmer. And that's what they found, right? They found that there were more southern species. And so ever since then, folks at Hopkins, they monitor that transect line every year. But partly what they had us do this year is they wanted another way of doing some of this. So we actually ran that transect uh, line for them. And so you're seeing one of our students there, Sarah, getting ready to launch the drone uh, to go and do that. And they were doing this for a couple of reasons. One, they wanted sort of visual documentation of how that's changing over a really big area, but also to create sort of a public education uh, component here. Uh, one of the things you start to realize, unless you live at the coast, you don't often have access, right, to these types of places here. And so they're also sort of part of a project, like how can you bring, if you're a kid in Kansas, how do you bring the inner title right, to a kid in Kansas? All right, and you can see we get really high resolution on these things. So this is one of the drones here, and you can see individual muscles. If you, if you were able to zoom in, come up here, you'd see like individual anemones or sea stars, all types of things. So that's the first question. Well, can you see anything? Yeah, you can see really a lot, a lot of stuff right in there, and you're getting a lot of that information in a pretty short amount of time. Now, I talked about creating visualizations. Like this is, this is an actual virtual fly-through to one of those 3D models, right? This is the Hewitt line. 
right? And so this is the type that we can post, and these are actually photos, create, put it together into a 3D environment. And so we're doing a virtual fly through, right, of the actual intertidal at Hopkins Marine Station here using the drone imagery, right, that, that we've collected here. And again, this drone imagery only took us about 20 minutes to collect at this point. You know, trying to do that whole area by hand, you'd be out there for a few days, right, trying to do that. Right, and you can also change the orientation. So that's kind of like the big view there. As I mentioned, you can rotate those models in all types of axes. And I can do a little top down <laughs> over here. Like maybe a top down's a better view here. Maybe you're a scientist and you're interested in trying to see what's there. Um, in this particular view here, right, you can start to see some of the surf grass that's over there. If you dig really in, you will see anemones in the tide pool. You'll see sea stars. I think at some point we fly over the survey team uh, over here. I think you'll, very, you'll see a little blur, I <laughs> think, at some point, over a little uh, white squares. At some point, there they are. You can see the little survey team was out there that day. You know, so we were in and out about an hour. You know, we got in there early in the morning, put the drone up, we're gone. You know, the survey team was still there. We're there. So it kind of gives you a sense of how much information we're getting in a very short amount of time right here. But yeah, this is starting to be, you know, where we're starting to go with trying to get monitoring data, right, out of the coastal environment. It's not just getting information, but also creating virtual experiences for individuals who may not have access, right, to this type of environment. Right. And we, we working up and down the coast. And so, you know, one of the things that started to happen is, you know, with COVID, we got approached a lot. Um, you know, it was no longer okay to have, you know, groups of five or six people working together. And so the question became, how do we, how do we start to get some of this information? And we got contacted a lot. I got a lot of phone calls and a lot of emails. You know, and one of the first groups that called us was actually a group at San Francisco State um, that's been doing work up at Pigeon Point Lighthouse. If you haven't been up there, it's just a little north of Santa Cruz, about another 20 to 30 minutes north, depending on traffic. It's part of California State Parks. And if you're familiar with the sea star wasting syndrome issue, they've been monitoring the recovery there. And how are we going to do that if we can't have our team of five or six? And so that's where we came in here. And so what this is, this is a 400 meter stretch of shoreline. This is a big area. I think this took us about an hour uh, to fully map here. And so you were working with state parks to get all the permits. You can ask me all about that as well. There's a stack of permits you have to get uh, to do all of this. But now what they have is they have this high resolution 3D map of that environment where they can start to go in and look at things like sea star recovery because things like sea stars really pop out right against the background uh, over here. And as I mentioned, we, we work in other environments. So, you know, drones, because of where they're going at in the air, they can cover a lot of different uh, areas on the coastal environment. And so one of the other more prevalent, one, uh, prevalent areas that we work in is our estuaries at this point. One of our first early colleagues uh, were actually you know, the folks at Elkhorn Slough. If you're not familiar with Elkhorn Slough, what's going on right there, there's a big restoration effort uh, going on over there at this part. It's called Yampa. As here. If any of you go over there, you know where the pick and pool is. It's just over on the other side. There's also a dairy. I think it's called Moonglow a Dairy that's over there. It's that whole area. And what they're doing, you can see a little bit of it up here. They've regraded that road. They've actually elevated it right above, above where it would normally be. It's a mitigation strategy against sea level rise, and then they're going to start to restore the vegetation there. But this is a big area to try to survey by hand, and so what we're doing is we're using our drones here to go and survey an adjacent area that's what they want it to look like, and then looking at it relative to the area that they want to survey. And so <clears throat> this is about a 40 hectare area, so it's about 800 by 800 meters, it's a big area <laughs> to survey and trying to trace through all that mud in your mud boots, that's a ton of work. I've done that before and it's really exhausting uh, to try to do that. Now the drone can do it anywhere from 11 to 30 minutes at this point, depending on the height that we're flying at over here. And we get these really high resolution maps that they can then go and use a lot of modeling techniques. Okay, are, are, is our restoration, is it keeping, is it expanding, is it compressing? Right, so they're able to do that in a relatively short amount of time. And that's our fixed wing drone there that we looked at earlier, getting doing one of its mapping missions about a month or so ago. <clears throat> and you know, we're actively using this to help the, you know, the, the estuary sort of assess what's going on. And so you know, one of our, our recent graduate students in our NOAA Center at CSUMB, Alexandra Thompson, you know, she did a huge project there using drones to try to assess from the air restoration, areas that re where they're doing restoration that were and weren't working. Right, and then she's using really high resolution mapping to produce a map of where are the hot spots of where this stuff's keeping, where it's not keeping and why. And so it's a view, right, a view on that system that we haven't had before, 
Right? And because you can looking at that view from a different perspective, you have new insight on what might be going on there that you're overlooking right, with some of your traditional survey methods. Right? And then you know, Alex, she turned this into, now she's a California Sea Grant <laughs> fellow, so she's working for the state of California, doing a lot of this type of work now. And, you know, and, we, and again, you know, this is something that's of public interest. You know, so the public's interested in this. You know, about a month or two ago, uh, KAZU came out. <laughs> they heard we were doing all these drone work. And so they came out for us for a day uh, and looked at what we were doing. And so if you're interested, you can listen to This was Doug McKnight. You can see him down there. And so the other person is Pat, uh, Pat Ann Pietro, who's our senior drone technician. And so he's, he's showing Doug, you know, the big fixed wing drone and how we're using it. That was another drone that we deployed out there as part of the rogue squadron going out there doing some other work out there. But it is a type of stuff where it's not just, okay, we've got this GWIS science. It's a type of science that can be relatable to a lot of folks. So you're using robots, you're using engineering, there's photos, there's a lot of cool Star Wars stuff in there, references uh, in there. And so he actually talks about that <laughs> in, the, in, the, in his story. And so, yeah, drones are a little bit more than just, hey, let's go get some data. It's another way of sort of using you know, emerging technology to engage the public in sort of an, an ongoing restoration efforts. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, you know, we've recently got into other areas. And so kelp forest ecology is something we got it into. So I am not trained as a kelp forest <laughs> ecologist. I'll be up upfront about that. But again, when the pandemic hit, we got a call. And so we got a call from uh, the Farallon's Greater uh, Sanctuary, the uh, Noah's Fer uh, Greater Farallon's National Marine Sanctuary. They have an ongoing project monitoring bull kelp for there. It's been heavily impacted by some of the warming trends right here in California, and that was one of their, best, their biggest challenges. That they were not allowed to go out on the boats anymore right during COVID to do it. And so like, how the heck are we gonna do all of this? And that's where the drones <clears throat> came in. And so we've been going out there for about the last two years now to support their ongoing kelp forest monitoring efforts. And so what we're doing is we're actually collecting you know, upwards of 800 to 1,000 meters of shoreline in about 45 minutes to an hour. That's a lot of area, and we're going about 500 meters offshore. So we're collecting giant sections right, of the shoreline for them and creating these high resolution maps right, of their kelp. <clears throat> and you can get a sense here of sort of the, what the resolution that you can see. And so we were flying at about 400 feet. Right, and just so you, as a uh, just as an FYI, that's as high as you can fly legally if you're doing commercial drone uh, flying. 400 feet is is the ceiling uh, put on you by the the FAA. But you can see even at that height, we can pick out lots of fine detail. Like if you if you go and look at this, I'll, I'll show you sort of our social media page. You can take a go on there. You can see the individual bulbs right on each one of the the bull kelp types that are over there. And so you can pick up a lot of that stuff. And so we're getting a lot of information in a short amount of time. In fact, these maps when we put them together. Uh, for example, one of the Elkhorn maps is about 30 gigabytes. <clears throat> and then we can put together, right, these nice aerial coverage maps, right, for the sanctuary up in the Farallon so they get a sense of what's going on. This is a view they haven't had right before because, you know, the view is you're kind of right there, but you can't see what the bigger picture is in this case. And this is one of their sites, but you can get a scale there. It's, it's about one and a half kilometers that this drone is mapping right at one shot, and it's going about 300 to 400 meters right offshore, that's a huge area that it would be really hard to do if you're an individual diver. I know I, I could not do that on my own. You would need teams of divers and boats, right, to be able to do that, and the drone's just going up and down. And so it's a very different way right, of doing science from how I was trained, right, or sort of what some of the common depictions are of it. Because really, we put the drone in the air, and then we just kind of wait for it to come back <laughs> over there. We, we kind of track where it's at, and then we, if something comes, uh, happens, you know, we have a drone operator who calls it back. Right, and that kind of gives you a sense of sort of how big a scale it is. So those little dots in the middle of the circle there, if you can see them, that's our drone team <laughs> over there. So it gives you a sense of how big that area is. And just for a reference, I'm going to go back one. That there is where we're at. <laughs> right, and so we've got to zoom in right, pretty far to see where it's at. So it's kind of giving you a sense of the large scales that, that we're mapping here, the amount of information that we're getting over a really short amount of time right, with some of these, these areas here. But the other part, you know, I, I, when I talk about, you know, using drones, you know, I wear two hats at, at CSGMB. You know, I'm someone who's interested in researching the marine environment, understanding how it works. Okay, what are the impacts to it? But I'm also interested in training the next generation of ocean scientists. Uh, and so that's the other way that we're using drones right, at CSGMB. It's to try to engage this next generation right, of ocean scientists who are equipped with the tools that you'll need to do 21st century right, ocean science. And one of the things you know, that COVID brought up, it, it highlighted a lot of the ways that the, the way that we do marine science and teach it, the way that it actually acts as a barrier 
right? Sometimes the students participating. You know, for example, you know, when I was growing up, the common stereotype is you gotta be like this Jacques Cousteau character, this Indiana Jones character, you're hopping off of boats and you gotta have like this secret stash of money and all, all that, you gotta be like Steve Zizou. Okay, that's, that can be a barrier to folks like, well, I don't wanna jump off of boats like Indiana Jones or like have sharks coming after me like the guy in Jaws, like I don't wanna do any of that. <clears throat> and one of the things that, you know, drones let us do, it let us re-envision a new way of engaging students in ocean sciences that we don't traditionally or have historically used. Right, and this is a great example of one of the things that we did you know, this past summer. So we run two programs. I run a lot of education and training programs on our campus. And so one of them is the SNOAA Center over here. So that's one of our undergraduate students, Sarah Kilbane. And so she's an FAA certified drone pilot now at this point. Uh, and she was allowed to work in person because of the nature of how she was doing this. She, it was her, right? that's it, and it was me as a supervisor. And that was it. It wasn't a team of eight people you know, packed in a truck trying to do all of this. Well, we had two other students, one of our other programs, our research experiences for undergraduates program, who weren't able to go out, right? They could not leave home, right? They weren't able to go. So, and, and because of that, like they were not going to be able to participate in a traditional research experience. And our solution was computing and technology in this case. And so the way that the, these, this group of students worked is you had Sarah out there collecting data, right? During the morning, she would upload it to a cloud server for the students to process the data they were then working, uh, Maria Rocha, who's one of our students, is up in Watsonville, and she's working with Ariana Soriano, who's living outside of San Diego. They're working over Zoom, uploading the data, doing all the data analytics on it, right? So they're working as the equivalent of a short team, right, in this case. And then what they do is they output that at the end and show it to me, and then we give it the okay. So what we do is we go from the more, Sarah collecting data in the morning, uploading it to a cloud server over lunch, Maria and Ariana, right, going ahead and analyzing the data and then sending me the results at the end of the day for review. It's a whole new education model. In fact, uh, you know, Maria just presented her work at the Ocean Science and at the International Ocean Sciences meeting. Sarah's getting ready to present this next, in about a week or so at the Benthic Ecology meeting. Neither of them would have had this opportunity, right, without the use of a different approach for teach, engaging students in the ocean sciences. <clears throat> Right. And then outreach, right, in education, right, is another way of, you know, using drones. You know, drones have this kind of, you know, this kind of narrative around them. Oh, the drones are scary. They're, they're doing strange things. Right? Everywhere we go, we always kind of get that. Like, what are the drones doing? Um, <clears throat> you know, one of the things that I like to try, you know, this is my bias, drones aren't that scary. Um, you know, we try to, one of the things that we do whenever we're out is we make sure to have sort of an education component where we're out in the, in the public. Uh, oftentimes, you know, I've got friends around here and they're always like, are you looking in our backyard? Like, the last thing I would do is look at what you're doing gardening right this month, right? I'm really, you know, there, there's a little bit of that sort of paranoia around it. And so what you're looking at here are our teams, right, engage in different types of outreach activities. So if you're looking over there, that's Charnel Wycliffe. She's a graduate student in my lab doing some work out on Catalina Island. Um, she's doing some work around boat moorings out there and looking at where they have it and how, how it sort of impacts a local uh, marine habitat that's there. And what you're looking at, it's one of the local boat owners with his grandkids, like, you know, they're learning about drones out there. And she's got a whole script about, you know, about the drones and what they're doing. And so the drones are becoming more approachable, right, at this point. They're not this scary new technology that's spying on you. Um, that's Pat, you know, who I showed you a picture of a little bit earlier in our talk there. That's when we were up at Sonoma County uh, doing our, our mapping. In fact, this is the spot where even though we had permission, there was a big sign that says no drone zone. <laughs> we went in there and, you know, we had the security guy come up and it was that. But everyone, it was, a, I remember the, the funny part about this, like we're doing our operations and it was actually this group of people and it, it might have been the lady in the blue shirt if I remember, she's like, where's your drone at? And, um, I was like, well, and I had to kind of pull her aside. I said, well, it's coming in for a landing, <laughs> little drone. Because, you know, in some people's heads, it's almost like they're expecting that helicopter scene from Apocalypse Now where they're like, you know, they're playing, you know, the ride of the Valkyrie and there's like dust getting kicked up. They're really tiny. You can barely hear them uh, half the time. And so it was really surprising to this group of people that the drones weren't like, you know, creating this massive sort of noise disturbance and kicking up dust, you know, and debris uh, everywhere. And so now all of a sudden, they're, uh, in fact, there's another picture where they're all like with their, pic their cameras, like taking pictures and selfies. And I think one of them took a, they had their granddaughter take a selfie with one of the, the drones over there. And so now it's this kind of fun, right, engaging technology. And the other thing that's really cool about it, with Pat showing them, <clears throat> the drones give you a live feed of what it's looking at as it's mapping. And so they're actually seeing parts of the ocean that they didn't have access to uh, before, because it's doing a live feed of what it's taking pictures of. So it really sort of, it, they came away like, really cool, are you guys coming back? We came back this year and they were back out again, you know, this year, you know, trying to see what we're doing, wanting to see some new photos. <clears throat> 
And then that's when, you know, one of our public outreach events at CSUMB, you know, where our, my lab, you know, we, we staff a drone table. We also have under what they call our, they call them underwater drones, but they're remotely operated vehicles. <clears throat> but it's a way for us to engage students early in the STEM, in their STEM sort of career and development about what it is that you do, right, in, in the ocean sciences. Because people do have that, that stereotype. You know, I grew up, I think the three sort of people I grew up with as marine scientists were Hooper from Jaws, Jacques Cousteau, and Steve Zizou, right? And that, that's kind of the perception of what it is <coughs> over there. You know, I run our REU program the first time we recruited for it. You know, I went to go I recruit some computer science students. Like, well, how do you use computers in the water? It's like, you don't use the computers in the water. You know, you did. And so there's kind of perceptions about what it is, what it does and doesn't mean. Right, to be in the marine scientists. In fact, you know, computer science is like one of the big areas in, in ocean sciences these days. So part of what we do with this is we also introduce students to different ways right, of being an ocean scientist. That there's not just one way being an ocean scientist, there's multiple ways of being an ocean scientist in this case. And when you do that, not only are you sort of engaging different people in the ocean sciences, you're bringing their, their kind of uh, perception, right, their innovative ways of looking right, at problems that you may not have engaged with using other tr more traditional methods right, in the ocean sciences. <clears throat> and so, you know, if you are interested in kind of keeping track of us over there, you know, one of the things you know, I, we, I'm active with our lab is we like to engage with the public a lot. So we do have a very active, you know, social media uh, presence there. That's our Facebook page. That was the first thing my students set up because they were like, Dr. Garza, we need social media. I was like, okay, all right. We, we're not on TikTok and I'm still like, oh, about the TikTok, you know, the dancing with drones down the ramp thing. But um, you can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Twitter. Um, you can find us on Instagram, you know, and we usually will post, you know, when we're out in the field, you can kind of see what we're up to or someone's doing a new training. You know, we have news and note on there, you know, from the bigger world of ocean technology. And so, you know, it is something, you know, I would sort of, you know, encourage you to take a look at. So you can see this is a different way, right, of doing ocean sciences, one that's a little new and novel, especially, you know, in some of the areas, you know, that we work in. But again, um, I'm going to close out here and say again, thank you for the invitation uh, to speak uh, to all of you today. And I'm always happy, you know, to field emails from folks like, hey, you know, we'd like to come down to our school and show us the kids the drones. We're always happy uh, to do that type of stuff. But yes, feel free to email us with any questions. And with that, I think we have time for questions. Uh, 15 minutes. Yeah. Time for a few questions. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> you're taking all these high resolution photographs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. So I didn't put that slide in there because they can get really, you get into weeds with it. Uh, but we, we do do a little bit of hand classification as a check, but we actually use um, automated processes for doing that. So there's a software package that we use. And the way that it works, if you know anything about a picture, when you take a picture, it's pretty much on your, your phone. <clears throat> it's just a blank grid of cells. And when you push picture, like the, you're the software in there, it captures all the wavelengths of light that come in. You can actually use that property to actually classify animals or, or different types of objects on the photo. So for example, um, you know, coral analogy, that pink algae you might see out there, it reflects light back at one wavelength. You know, kelp reflects light back at another wavelength. You can train software to pick up pixels, right, on your photo that are in those wavelengths of light. And then the, the, pick, the software will know that any time I pick up a wavelength of light from these areas, that's coral analogy or that's you know, that's kelp. And we do manually test that, like we do like a blind test, we do a double blind test to see, okay, how, how close are we on there? But that's primarily how we do it, because they're really big areas. Like, I've done that by hand, like in the early days when doing this, and yeah, I'd be there with my headphones. It's always like, you know, it's almost like knitting a little blanket or something. You're just there for like eight hours, like, you know, hand counting stuff. The software, you know, it takes about an hour to train the software, but once you've got it trained, um, you, you do a big batch of these things, and it knocks it out in about five minutes or so, depending on the speed of your computer. You do it in GIS. Yeah, you can do it in GIS. There's other software packages. We use it. In, it's a software package called ArcMap uh, that we use, and so we do it in that. So. But you also have to have a really fast computer. So like, you don't want to get like, oh, here's my off-the-shelf computer. We have to get a custom-built computer. We have a few of them in the lab uh, to do that. So. Yeah. I have a question about like uh, your restoration. How are you affecting restoration at the L2? Are you looking at vegetation in the field? Yeah, well, yeah. That's pretty what you're doing. So right now, it's all the before stuff. So everything's just flat dirt. So we're doing all the before, but yeah, we're, we use vegetation, NDVI, and, and those types of things. So we use multispectral uh, to do that. And the, the pixel thing, the way that that works, because um, you, you wouldn't say like, I'm going to do the density, the number of pickle weed shoots per area, because that would take you forever to do. You do a percentage of the area. So you can, uh, you can use the picture and say, okay, I know there's a thousand pixels in the picture, 
and 500 of those pixels are categorized as pickle weeds, so that means you've got 50% cover right in there. Right? And then you can you look at the changes in, in the number of pixels over time right, that are classified as pickle weed or not to look at whether or not it's expanding or compressing. Right? Are you able to calculate any like, productivity you can't in the soil with that. You can in the nearshore water. So the, the multispectral stuff, um, you can pick up different species of phytoplankton, which give you a sense of sort of what the productivity is like in the coastal water. Yeah? Um, how hands-on is it when you stitch all the images together to get a 3D model? Or do you just like yeah, upload the photos? And yeah, we upload it. So in fact, uh, the, the package that we use, um, the company picks 4D, they're based out of Switzerland. So we upload the photo. It goes to a cloud farm in Switzerland, and it gets processed there, and then we get an email that it's ready. So, like, it's, you know, because uh, these are big, right? If you try to uh, mesh one of these on your, like, we did one on our lab computer, and that has 30 gigabytes of RAM. That's the speed of your computer, and it took it three days to do it, right? And so that's, that's a really fast, expensive computer, you know, you know, relative to, you know, standard computer. And so that the, the server farm in Switzerland, they just, whoosh, and then they turn it around, and, and we get an email, ping, it's ready to download, and, and we download it. Yeah, you, you do, just because you get subtle variations in light. Um, you know, we just, it, it, that, that'll affect it a little bit. So when we do, when we do like, we, we create what's called a script, which is a little, it's kind of, it's the classification. And we knew we, all those photos in the same day, same elevation. We knew what the light level was on that day. We can correct for a lot of that. So we know it'll work for the 8,000 photos that we collected that day. If we go on another day where it's cloudy and overcast, it's going to change. So like we just had this issue with another colleague where he's, um, He's got 40 years of panoramas on Catalina Island. You can actually watch muscle beds disappear over 40 years. Like Southern California used to look like here in the 70s, and I don't have that photo in here, but because of the, he was using, because um, he's, he's the one I used to work with, he was processing uh, slide film, right? And it's slide film that's Kodachrome or it's Fuji Chrome, right? And so there's different tints and all that. And so we, we did as best to correct it, but each photo then needed its own script, right, to classify it over there. So that's kind of one of the things you work with. It's, it's a bigger issue if you're working with older photos, right, where the grain is different, the resolution's different. Digital imagery, you can do a lot of that correcting, and so oftentimes you can apply that same script. But if it's real different environmental condition, you're going to have to redo the, the script for that. But it doesn't take a ton of time to do it. Some of those photographs, I mean, they look like they had been, especially um, just offshore, where it looked like transparent, the water was, the sea water wasn't even there. It's like it was taken underwater instead of an aerial shot from a drone. Yeah. Is it, were there algorithms to correct like the wave interference pattern mm -hmm. on the surface to get rid of those? Yeah, or? yeah, we, we, we do quite a bit of that. Um, we do that with all your post-processing, but we can also just train the software just to pick up on the stuff on the surface. So there's certain corrections uh, that we can do. Yeah, we try to do as best we can, you know, early morning to, you know, late, you know, early, early morning to late morning just before the afternoon for a couple of reasons. Uh, glare. You probably see some of those photos, we get glare. So we, if we're going to do it in the afternoon, we have to do a lot of camera adjustments to adjust for that. Uh, if you don't do that, like, for example, coral and algae, it just comes out like this room, like the walls on this room, which is a big white blotch uh, on there. The other reason, depending where you're at, uh, those of you who, who live here in the spring, uh, you know how windy it gets. Okay, the wind and the drones do not get along. Like they can, they can go up to about 28 to 30 mile an hour winds, and past that, we start. It starts to get upset. It's like it's too windy, and we get this like we get this red notification, and so that's the other reason why. So we try to do it, but if we know we're in a location with no wind, <clears throat> we'll wait till the later afternoon uh, to do it when the glares die down a little bit. Yeah, one time I was, um, I just happened to be at the NOAA building in Pacific Grove, mm -hmm. the former one, and um, a drone crossed overhead. And it was early evening, like it was almost dark, and I don't know if it was a research drone or not. Probably not. <laughs> um, and so it was, it was odd that it was flying at night like that. Right? Yeah, you're, um, if, there's a lot of rules around that. So like all of our pilots, they have to go through an FAA uh, a pilot license test. So it's an official uh, commercial license grade. Uh, but one of the rules is you can't fly at night unless you get permission uh, to do that because of certain issues. Because it's hard to see the drone at night, right? If you got a low-flying yeah, aircraft. <laughs> yeah, you know, we do have those big drones, those Jogon, the big ones. Those have special night operation lights, like a bright strobe. And that's actually designed for a nighttime operation. And so if we ever do something like that, we can't see much. Um, we would do that. The only reason we would do nighttime flights, we have thermal cameras. And so thermal imagery, like picking up temperatures, works really well at night. 
over there. So it would work well for that, but you know, by and large, you wouldn't do it just because there, there's restrictions around. So it might have just been someone with a, a drone. Plus, Pacific yeah. Grove, yeah, you need a permit. You need a permit from the police department, right? And then you need a NOAA uh, sanctuary permit to fly. And so there's a lot of different rules around that. So they probably would have said no to a night operation. Yeah? I know this could be a very long answer, but what kind of, what kind of projects are you working on with this help? Like, what kind of questions are you asking? Yeah, primarily right now with the, the Farallons, they're just interested in persistence at this point. And, and they've got some restoration projects where I, they're doing something similar here where they're removing urchins, right? And that's really what the sanctuary is interested in. One is the stuff we're doing, keeping the kelp that's there, and then longer term is the kelp expanding, right? And that's kind of the basics right around it, so. Okay, great. Thank you. That was Thanks. fascinating. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. No worries. Okay, so we will return at 2.15. Thank you for being here and for your attention.